Welcome. This is our last talk before Christmas. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to those who are joining us live now and those of you who will be watching on our recording on YouTube. Um, we are, we've got a new speaker this morning, Paul Gillingham, and Paul is speaking to us from his home in Guildford, and he is a member of the Guildford Travel Club, and he's done lots of talk um, for them and other groups as well. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Tricia, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I've got a terrible <coughs> confession to make, I'm afraid, which is that I've never in my life been to Leicester. I know it's a great city, um, great football team and lots of other great things, uh, but I've never been there and I hope one day to get there. But I hope you won't hold that against me. But many thanks for joining me today and us today on this week before Christmas, amazingly. Now, this is a talk, this is a journey I did with my son Joseph in uh, February, March of 2019. And we wanted to cross Spain, but we didn't know what sort of route to take. And then we hit on the idea, why don't we cross Spain as the Romans did 2000 years ago? Uh, and so this is what we did. And there's the map of the route that we took. Now it's called the Via de la Plata, which in English is the, um, silver route because oh. in Roman times the Romans transferred precious metals between Seville and the north of Spain uh, but we actually started our ride our bike ride in Cadiz uh, prior to Seville and then we went on up to Santiago de Compostela. So here we are on the first couple of days lovely weather as you can see clear blue sky and this is February bear in mind but um, also bear in mind that Cadiz is the sunniest or one of the sunniest cities in the whole of Europe. Uh, and there you can see the sea here, that's the Atlantic Ocean. And just beyond Cadiz, of course, is the Mediterranean. So it's on the confluence of these two great seas. And that's what's created its wealth and its importance throughout history. And here's a map now of Cadiz. And you can see it's a narrow peninsula. And the old part of the city, which is a great place to sort of see the historic side, is in the front there. And that was great to sort of cycle around and walk around. Um, now, but something about Cadiz is it's the oldest still lived in city in the whole of Europe. Julius Caesar, during Roman times, came here in uh, 49 BC. Um, and Columbus sailed from here to the Americas uh, in, the, in the 16th century. So there we are, very important city. And there's a uh, typical street in the old town, lovely white buildings, white balconies, great to walk around and cycle around, no traffic in the center there. Now here are the towers, and in the old days, there were 160 watchtowers where merchants would watch out for ships coming in from Spanish America, often filled with gold and silver. And the tallest tower is this one here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, which is called the Tavira Tower. And you can get, anyone can go to the top of it. And here's a view, we went to the top, and here's a view looking across to, in the distance there, you can see the cathedral. And here are the beaches of Cadiz, lovely white sandy beaches. And we went swimming there, not in wetsuits, and there were plenty of others doing it as well. And this was in February, bear in mind. And here's another view from the tower, and you can see that modern bridge, which links mainland Spain here with Cadiz but cyclists could not cross it. So we had to find another way of getting onto mainland Spain on Cadiz, which we'll see in a moment. Now we're in pursuit of Roman uh, Cadiz and Roman Spain. So we went to the museum of Cadiz here. And here's a map just inside there of Gades. In Roman times, it was known as Gades. And you can see on the left here, or just about uh, aqueduct, no longer there, Colosseum, no longer there, and a theatre, which is still there, actually, um, and a channel here, which is, again, no longer there. Yeah. 
And here are some of the statues which they dug up in old Cadiz or in Cadiz, showing uh, the Roman times there. And this is that theatre I mentioned, which is not far from the museum, uh, built by the Romans 2000 years ago. And a wall just outside of that uh, theatre. And on that wall is this sign, the Camino de Santiago, Via Augusta. The first part of our journey from Cadiz to Seville is along this route called the Via Augusta, an ancient Roman route. And along the way, the whole way up to Santiago, you see this symbol of the, um, the scallop shell and the yellow arrow. And you see these symbols all the way to help you on your, your way to Santiago. So here's the first part of our journey. Now, I said to you that we couldn't cross that bridge, so we had to come around here to the first little town called El Puerto de Santa Maria, and then on to Jerez de la Frontera, a great city, and then up to Seville. And here we start off. Now, that's Joseph uh, on his bike on the route, the Via, de la, or Via Augusta, and you can see it's flat marshland. And on that marshland, lovely sort of stalks and birds and so on. And you can see in the distance modern uh, Cadiz, and then on the right here, the ancient city of Cadiz. And you first come to this little town called Santa Maria, uh, El Puerto de Santa Maria. And that's famous really for one thing here, Osborne, an English sherry firm, which was founded in the 19th century. And bear in mind that the area we're in now is the great cherry producing area of the world. And the symbol of Osborne's is the bull. And in 1954, uh, the company decided to have a new advertising slogan. <laughs> and they got in a designer who designed this, the great bull, the Spanish bull. And that's why throughout Spain today, when you're on any motorway or any road, you'll see in the countryside, the black Osborne bull. And here, here he is, for example. And then we come to the first great city in Andalusia, north of Cadiz, uh, which is Jerez de la Frontera, famous for two main things. One is its production of sherry and brandy. And secondly, it's one of the great centers in Andalusia of Spanish flamenco, gypsy flamenco. And here we are in uh, Jerez, Williams and Humbert, again, an English company, uh, founder of the uh, Sherry Company, uh, with its bodega, its winery. But the great uh, Sherry producer is, of course, Tio Pepe. And here's uh, the founder himself. Uh, he was a man called Manuel Gonzalez, who in the 1830s, 1840s, made an alliance with an Englishman called Robert Bias, and they set up the company Gonzalez Bias. And you can, they called their uh, product Tio Pepe, which means Uncle Pepe, because uh, Gonzalez's uncle Pepe was a great supporter of him. And in this photo, I hope you can see the Cathedral of Jerez in the background. And here's the bodega of Tio Pepe, and you can see this on this uh, advertising sign here, Palomino Fino, the Palomino grape is what's special about the sherry that they produce in Jerez. And we went on a little tour of the uh, Bodega, and you see casks like this, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Edward VIII, uh, Duke of Windsor, George, Duke of Kent, Churchill for his 80th birthday. And this one, <laughs> I enjoyed seeing Bobby Charlton, one of the great heroes of the 1966 World Cup, which have you just recently, as you'll know, been diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's or dementia. But to, to the left there is Manolete, uh, probably Spain's greatest bullfighter, who was gored to death by a bull in 1947. And below him here, below Bobby Charlton, is Andres Segovia, uh, the great Spanish classical guitarist. And here, Oliver Hardy. I have to say, I didn't see one for Stan Laurel. 
perhaps he wasn't the drinker that uh, Ollie Hardy was. Now back to that main square in Jerez, and this statue in the square of, is of this man on the right here, General Miguel Primo de Rivera, who was the dictator of Spain uh, between 1923 and 1930, and was in a sense, because of his rule, the indirect cause of the Spanish Civil War, which broke out five years later in 1935. Now, when you walk around Jerez, you go behind these buildings here and you come upon these flamenco bars. And we ended up in this one and it was jam packed. There was standing room only. You see a few people at the front there and they happened to get seat, but we were jam packed. And I, I tried to take a video, um, which wasn't that easy because I was sort of under pressure. There. But I want to show you this video because of this flamenco is amazing. Every hand gesture, every eye gesture, apart from the dancing, tells a story. And uh, we were so impressed with this and there weren't tourists there, they were mainly Spanish people in there. Uh, and it was fantastic and I hope this video shows. <laughs> Yes, that passion was just terrific. It was great to be there. Now we're on our way from Jerez to Seville and you can see the white chalk behind. Now this uh, soil is called Albariza and it's chalky soil. And this is the vineyard for Gonzalez Bias, Bias, as you can see on that white building there in the distance, uh, the makers of Tio Pepe. And because it's chalk, it means when it rains, which it sometimes does, rain goes well down into the soil and the roots of those vines go down 15 meters. And this produces the great white uh, grape called the Palomino grape, which makes for the best sherry and then brandy in the whole of Spain, if not in the whole world. And you see this Albariza chalky soil just north of Jerez. And then the, as you get closer to Seville, I was amazed at how dry the soil was, as you can see in this picture. Uh, <laughs> occasionally oranges, we didn't see any orange trees at this uh, stage, but plenty of uh, old oranges. And then you come to a river. Now, you'll know this river probably, it's the Guadalquivir, which runs through Seville and through Cordoba. And, uh, a great river and we had to cross it and we waited for this ferry to get across and that took us en route for Seville. And here we are in Seville at the Plaza de España, one of the great sites of Seville. Now I won't stay long with Seville because most of you probably have been there, but you have to go to the cathedral. You see the Giralda, the great tower here, built by the Muslims during Arab rule of Spain, and then added to at the top here by the Catholics team um, uh, top there to it. But you go inside and you see the tomb of Christopher Columbus, who sailed, as I said, from Cadiz, one of the great heroes of Spanish America, the founder really of, of but of course, times are different now. And I got this picture from the internet taken in Boston recently, and they beheaded him. And they beheaded the statue of Columbus in a number of cities in America because of his association with colonialism, with the slave trade. 
and we're in pursuit of Roman uh, Spain and the one uh, building or piece of architecture that's still there from Roman times is this aqueduct which ran from Cremona to Seville 10 miles and it was in use more or less until 1912 and then it was demolished and that's all you see of Roman remains in Seville itself. But if you go just say nine kilometers north of Seville, you come to this, Italica, one of the great Roman cities of Roman Spain. Uh, and it was here that was born, who was born three great Roman emperors. That gives you an idea of the importance of Italica. And they were Vespasian, Trajan, and Hadrian, who built Hadrian's Wall. Uh, the north of England. Great theatre there, lovely mosaics in Italica. And just outside of there is this sign, Camino de Santiago, which of course we're on now, and now we're on the Via de la Plata, take us to Santiago. And this is the route from Seville, you can see in the south here, and you're, we're still in Andalusia, and then this white area with cities like Merida, Atheres, and Placentia in the north here. This is the area, the autonomous region of Extremadura, which is traditionally one of the poorest areas of Spain. And, and it's more or less off the tourist, you know, it's not a, a famous sort of tourist area. This was our route now going north. And we didn't know what. Uh, what, what the route exactly was. So we had to get a map and uh, the only thing we could find was this walking guide to the Via de la Plata and the Camino. And that was very helpful. It had sort of all sorts of information like this on where to stay, what the landscape was and where to find the route, which was sometimes a bit difficult. But we start off lovely sort of, um, uh, flowers, spring flowers, although it's still late February, uh, but you see the beginnings of uh, flowers, lovely, especially in that one. And then you come to the first hurdle on the Via de la Plata. Now this was a kind of lake, <laughs> a great big pond across the route, and there was no way our bikes could get through there because the panniers would have been covered in water. But somebody kindly had or thoughtfully had made a bridge in on the left here in this in this tree this tree area and here it is a girder which wasn't easy to cross but joseph was very good at getting the bikes across there and so we press on now as we press on the via de la plata gets pretty tricky for a, a cyclist and bear in mind i don't have a mountain bike i've just got a road bike and joseph's was a hybrid bike and the road is, or the route, is, is pretty difficult on a bike, as you can see. And then it gets more difficult. And then it gets even more difficult. And then it gets almost impossible. Now, this was the worst route I think I'd ever been on a bike. The only way we could get up here was to push them, up, obviously, you know. Uh, and another one bites the dust. <laughs> With those heavy panniers, it was just hard to keep balance and uh, a bit of blood was spilled. But what intrigued me was, that you see this sign, Santiago de Compostela, 927 kilometers. And I thought at this stage, there's no way we're gonna do this on this sort of route. Uh, we had, from this point, we had about three weeks to get to Santiago. It wasn't always a rough road like that. It was sometimes we were on the actual tarmac road going north. And you can see it's totally empty. Uh, for reasons which I'll explain later. But you see, I've got rain gear on. This was the one day in the whole month that we were on this cycle tour uh, that it rained. Only one day. And as we went along that road, we met the first of the sort of fellow pilgrims. This chap, he was a German. His name was Frank. He was and he lived in Malaga. And you can see he's been on pilgrimage. I don't know if you can see those, the scallop shells on his bike. He'd been to Santiago already. And he told us that in one of his panniers here was the urn of his wife, Julie, who had died 
10 months before. And he was taking her ashes to the various religious shrines in Western Europe. So in those 10 months, he'd cycled up to Fatima, the shrine of Fatima in Portugal. He'd been to Santiago de Compostela, spread her ashes there. He went across the north of Spain to Lourdes in France, then into Italy, to Rome and Assisi, and was on his way back down. Uh, he'd come down uh, the coast of Spain, back to Malaga, his home, and he was heading off again to Santiago de Compostela. And he said to me, he said, I've got no money. I wild camp all the time, but this is my life to, in, in, in grief in a sense, and uh, to do something for his much beloved wife who had died a month previously. Then we get to our first, uh, well, one of our first, Peregrino. Uh, you see Del Peregrino there. This means for pilgrims. It's a pilgrim hostel. Uh, and this is the kind of place we'd stay in much of the time. And that evening, when you're on a pilgrimage, you meet other pilgrims. And that evening, we sat around the table prior to dinner. Uh, and this chap on the left, for example, they were all walkers. And they were walking to Santiago de Compostela. All separately. This chap on the left here was a Ukrainian Catholic. He was doing the walk for religious reasons. Then we've got a, a South Korean couple with a younger man in the middle there, and they just met that day on the on the walk. They were sort of friends together for the evening. And then this young woman in front here, her name was Katerina, and she was a psychology postgraduate at the University of Cologne. And she was always smiling. She was a lovely girl. And I said to her, um, you know, why are you, she was walking on her own from Seville to Santiago de Compostela. And I said to her, why are you doing this? And she said, well, I've just split up with my boyfriend of nine years. She met him when she was 15, she's now 24. And this was a way of expressing her new life in a way, post this boyfriend. And when we were in that uh, albergue or uh, hostel, on the balcony, this was the view, lovely white buildings, uh, castle up on the hill there. And then we press on and we get to our first town in Extremadura. You can see the orange trees here. And the town is called Monasterio, and it's famous for one thing. This, the jamón, the monasterio, the ham the special Hamon Iberica, the Spanish ham. And these pig's legs, the most, I mean, it's so special, this ham, that the most expensive pig's legs, necessarily in this butchers, uh, they can cost up to 3,500 pounds sterling for one leg. The meat is so special. And the reason it's special is because of these black, from Maduran pigs and for five months of the year uh, their diet is acorns from these oak trees and it, it, this uh, meat is so famous in Spain that you've got the one probably the only museum in the world devoted to ham. <laughs> Here we are the Museo de Hamon in Monasterio and of course in the evening you have to have uh, a plate of um, Iberian hamon Iberica de Belota, which is acorns, acorn made ham, very expensive, of course. Now we press on to our route on our route along the Via de la Plata, and of course, there are other users sheep, goats, uh, cattle. I was a bit worried about those horns on the, whatever they are up uh, front of me, uh, especially this one, but he let me go through, he let us go through, and that was fine. Uh, and then we, of course, have other hazards along the Via de la Plata. Joseph was very good on getting lights across these tricky bits. And then we come upon this man. Now, we met him in the hostel the previous night, and he'd set off at six o'clock that morning. We were much later. And on the route, we came across him. He was Italian. He couldn't speak a word of English. But he happened to mention to me something about a restaurant he owned in the Piazza di Spagna in Rome, which is the Spanish step. 
said to him, Spanish steps. He said, see, sí, see. Sí. Uh, so I got him to write down his details in my notebook. And here they are. And at the bottom there, you see Carlo Mingacha, 62 years old, Piazza di Spagna, and the Ristorante La Rambla. Now I'm going to do a diversion here. I'm going to take you to Rome six months after I took that photo. And here we are, I went to Rome in June last year with my wife and a couple of the kids. And we went to the Spanish Steps and we looked at the Ristorante alla Rampa. And of course, it, it is nowhere to be seen. But then we found some steps on the right here, which go down, down to another piazza just next to it. Here it was, the Ristorante alla Rampa. That chap had told me about, and he was, I thought, the owner. I go inside the restaurant and I say to one of the uh, waiters, do you know this Carlo Mingace? He didn't really know what I was talking about. He said, just a moment. And he brought the manager. And here we are standing outside. And there's the manager on the right, Antonio Mingace. And he was the son of Carlo. And he said his father, this is six months later, this is June, <laughs> or July rather, I think, of last year. And six months later, and his father was still walking the Caminos, and he'd done three Caminos that year. Uh, he was on his third, he'd done the Camino uh, uh, Via de la Plata, he'd done the Camino Portuguese from Lisbon, and he'd done across northern France and the Camino Frances to Santiago. Amazing. There he is, Alo Mingacha. Now, en route there, we come upon more vineyards and the earth, I was intrigued to see the earth was red. Red vine, olive tree. And again, an empty road, we're on the Camino and you can see not a sign of traffic. And I, although there's a bike path on the right there, I could have ridden in the middle of the road and would probably have been okay, but some of the time for reasons I'll tell you a bit later. And then we come to the first great Roman city, this, that bridge, the Puente Romano, the Roman bridge, the longest bridge in Europe, built by the Romans. And we're in the city of Merida, which was the capital of the Roman province of Lusitania. And when you go around it, all sorts of Roman ruins, or Roman artifacts, like this great arch. The Temple of Diana, built by the Romans. The great Roman amphitheater. This, the real stunner, which is that Roman theater of uh, Merid. It seated, apparently in Roman times, 6,000 people. But today it seats 3,000 people, and every year they have a music festival there in Merida, in that theatre. And then just north of Merida, you come upon this. And what are these with storks on the top? Uh, they're part of the great aqueduct that runs from a, a, a reservoir into Merida. We'll come onto that reservoir in a moment. But I, I just want to show you this place. Now, you probably would possibly wonder, where do you stay in a place like uh, Merida if you're a pilgrim? And this, we stayed in this rather unprepossessing hostel. And you can see the pilgrim symbol there at the top. And this was the, <laughs> this was the dormitory at eight o'clock in the morning. You had to leave by eight o'clock in the morning. An hour previously, it was packed, uh, <laughs> uh, packed out with people. And my bed was on the top left here. And below me was a, uh, a sort of middle-aged, a nice German lady. And Joseph's bunk was up here, and below him was that nice girl we met earlier, Katerina, the German from University of Cologne. And next morning, the two ladies, the German ladies, we joined them for breakfast, and there they are. They just met each other in the hostel that night. And I said to uh, Katerina, always smiling, I said, surely you haven't walked, you know, from the area wherever we met earlier to Merida. And she said, no, she had to take the bus because her boots were hurting and she had blisters, terrible blisters. So the two of them were going to spend the day in Merida 
looking for shoe shops to find a new pair of boots for and whether they got to Santiago, of course, we never know. Now, I mentioned that reservoir uh, that, that, that leads to the, uh, the aqueduct in Merida. And here is the reservoir, Presa, Reservoir Romano, a Roman of uh, Pina. And a dam was built there by the Romans way back 2,000 years ago. And here's the water which supplied Merida via the aqueduct. But of course, it doesn't do that now, but it had a certain use for us. As you'll see, uh, mending punctures. One of our many punctures, and of course, it's great to use that water for putting the inner tube in and looking for, you know, to mend the puncture. Now we're en route again for Cáceres, uh, which is uh, one of the great cities in Extremadura. Again, a totally empty road. There we are in Cáceres, in the main square, the Plaza Mayor lovely great square it was um, and I, I said to you earlier that Extra Madura was one of the poorest areas of Spain but there was great wealth historically here and it was because of two men of the 16th century who were natives of this part of Extra Madura. First one you perhaps know of him or you will know of him Anan Cortes. He was the one who defeated the uh, Aztecs over Mexico or Spain in the 16th century. And he was born not far from uh, Cáceres and Mérida. And also a local man was Francisco Pizarro, uh, founder or the man who defeated the Incas and took over Peru uh, for the Spanish. And because of these two men, that's how um, Spain in the uh, Middle Ages uh, had, had control of Spanish America and was one of the great empires of the world, very wealthy in this part of uh, the world. And that's why in Cáceres you get these lovely old buildings built on the back of the wealth created by Spanish America. And I should say Cáceres is also famous for its storks. See them everywhere. Uh, so these storks, um, but the best, uh, I'll come on to the greatest uh, photograph of these storks in this area, I didn't take, I got it from the internet, but um, it's uh, from a village just outside of Cáceres called Mal Malpartida de Cáceres, and it's the great stork capital there you see it. Now we come on to a Roman route now. We're crossing a Roman bridge and you see these stones uh, along the way, these pillars. They're all Roman from 2000 years ago. And then we press on on the Via de la Plata. Um, here we are on the Via de la Plata. Uh, and that, that we've just crossed that Roman bridge and we've come along with these stones here, Roman stones. And then you come to a stone like this. It's called a Milario. It's a milestone. Um, and you see them on this route along the way. And here's a few of them just <laughs> dumped around from Roman times. And of course, hazards you come across uh, as usual on the Via della Plata. And as I said, it, we only have one day of rain. So you can imagine what it would be like if there was a terrible, impossible. Now here's our route. We've come up from Cáceres. We've gone through Placentia and I was going to show you pictures of Placentia, Placentia but um, I think we wouldn't have the time so I've taken them out. But north of Placentia, the first great town is Salamanca, uh, as you can see there. And now we're, we're in the uh, autonomous region of Castilla y Leon. Uh, and then we go up to Zamora and across here, and then we're up towards Urense, and we're in Galicia uh, for this section of the ride. And then end up, of course, in Santiago de Compostela. Now, here we are on the route again, and you can see it's pretty flat at this stage. And there's a symbol there for the uh, Santiago de Compostela route. And down here, 
is a sign for the Via de la Plata. And there's another sign for the Via de la Plata. And you can see this arch across the roadway here. And we wondered where that was and we wanted to go there. And of course, we eventually get yeah. um, there we are at the uh, a place called Capara. And this was a great Roman city in Roman times, but it's basically deserted now. The whole area is deserted, uh, but you've got this great Roman arch. And of course, being on the Via della Plata, you have to cycle through it. And this is what we did, of course. And then we press on from Capara and we hit another sort of rocky track uh, on the Via della Plata. And you can see the mountains, the Sierra to the right here, uh, and they're pretty big, but luckily we didn't have to cross them. Uh, we kept to the side of them, we skirted them basically. And there are hazards along the way, you know, you've got to get over these streams and Joseph always very good at getting my bike across if it was particularly difficult. Now I've said to you all, all along the way that um, the tarmac road that we sometimes took was empty and you can see the reason why, because the, the road is on the left, that's the Nacional, uh, I think it was the C25, which runs from south to north of this part of Spain. But the Spanish government, with the help of the European community, had built this motorway. So all the traffic essentially was on that motorway, and this left this main road fairly in. Now, along that main road, we came, there were, one of the days, it was very, very, there was a terrific headwind. So we had to sort of stop early and we came to this rather dull looking hostel, the Asturias. Uh, and we went there in the afternoon and we went in the bar there. We were going to stay there overnight. It was a great place to stay actually, but the bar was empty. And behind these toys here, up on the wall, you can't see it in this picture, was a television. And the manager, who's on the left here, had on the bullfighting channel, which I'll film in a moment. Uh, and you see this manager on the left. Now he's pointing with his right arm down to show me this, his right calf, that tattoo. And then he took out, the reason he was showing me this, this was because he then took out his mobile phone and I took a picture of the picture on the mobile phone with that tattoo on his right calf to prove it was him in a bullfight. <laughs> and I said to him, well, you don't support bullfighting in the modern era, you know, the terrible cruelty to bulls and so on. Typical sort of English view. And he said, yes, but we're Spanish, you know, and it's part of our great tradition. And he said, it's part of our culture and skill bullfighting is extreme, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. And he was rather ashamed to admit that he had failed to become a matador, which he wanted to become, that's why he was training here, but he hadn't made it. But that was his story. Now, I told you I watched that television and I took some pictures from a live bullfight which was happening that day in Valencia. And it was this young man with his bull from this bullfight in Valencia on that very day. And there he is, a young man, he's probably early 20s, but very sort of arrogant, uh, posturing and so on. And the next thing I saw on the television was this, <laughs> upended by the bull. And in the audience was his mum, and she was horrified to see this. I mean, he could have been killed, but he actually was okay. And he walked off, you know, very much shaken, but he was okay. But the poor old bull, of course, was dispensed with uh, afterwards. And the next program on that television channel, the Bullfighting Channel, was about female bullfighters. It featured this woman. And there she is, Conchita Sintron, la diosa de oro, the goddess of gold. She was one of the great female bullfighters of Spain, retired in 1950, having killed apparently 750 bulls. She wasn't Spanish, she was born in Chile and she started her career in Peru, but became one of the great Spanish bullfighters. 
And when she retired, she passed on, or later on, she passed on her mantle to this lady. Hollywood star looks, Marie Sarah, uh, a French woman, but again, one of the great, she started a bullfighting career in the south of France and then came to Spain. And became one of the great female bullfighters of Spain. And there she is. She's in her 50s now, I think she's retired. But she stood a couple of years ago for the Legislative Assembly of Spain and only just got defeated. So she's an, uh, an aspiring politician. She was married to Henri Lecomte, if you remember him, Wimbledon tennis star. I don't think he won Wimbledon, but he was in the final a few times and they were married. So there we are. But I always thought the bullfighting was a very masculine, uh, macho thing. But of course, women do do it. Now we press on on the Via della Parte and we're getting into very hilly country. This was pretty tricky cycling because, you know, it's quite a hill to climb. And then we hit this awful route on the Via della Parte, which was almost as bad as it was north of Seville. And then it gets you know, terrible, really difficult going. And poor old Joseph, it must have been something he'd eaten the night before. And he was really sick. It wasn't strangely because he I mean he's a tough guy but he was really out of it that day but still he had to push his bike up as we both did you know awful via de la plata and he was flat out there you can see him you know, awful situation and then we came to this ancient village and luckily we found somewhere to stay in that village and by the next day he sort of was feeling quite a bit better so that was a great reason and there we press on and you see the mountains snow capped now the Sierras. Uh, again, thankfully, we didn't have to cross them, we skirted them. And there's Joseph that next day, you know, feeling a lot better. And then we come to the next great Roman city, uh, Salamanca. Plenty of you have been there. Two cathedrals, there we are, from the Roman. And this Puente Romano is the great Roman bridge of Salamanca. And in the centre of the town is the Plaza Mayor, one of the great plazas of uh, Spain. And I don't know if you can see, but you see these arches around the side here. Now, all along there, all around the square, are loads of medallions uh, in, built in. And you see them there, and they are for famous great Spanish writers, politicians, you know, uh, philosophers, and so on. And we went into this cafe and we chatted to this lady. It was a lovely lady and she could speak pretty good English. And she told us about the medallions. And she said, yes, they're, they're to famous Spaniards, like, for example, this one to uh, King Juan Carlos. You remember him? I mean, and so King of Spain, now disgraced. And his wife Sophia. But there was one of all these medallions, she told us. There's one Englishman, and here he is, Lord Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, one of the great heroes of this part of Spain because of Salamanca in the Peninsular Wars of 1812, where he helped the Spaniards defeat. Napoleon's army uh, in the early 19th century, before Waterloo, this was. And Wellington still has that, or his house is still there in Salamanca. We didn't get to it, but there's strong associations between the Duke of Wellington and uh, Salamanca. And then you come to a medallion, this lady told us, which is empty. And you can perhaps guess whose symbol or whose uh, face was there. And it was Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain from the Spanish Civil War, 1935, until his death in 1975, ruled uh, almost a fascist dictatorship in Spain for 40 years. And of course, he's out of favor now in modern Spain. They removed his body from the great mausoleum where buried in, in state, moved his body, his room, uh, and they've taken down his... 
Now, when I was on that square, I, I was intrigued by some of the Spanish faces, both old and uh, young. And so I'll just show you a few Spanish faces there. In And I have to tell you, Salamanca is a great, or was always, a great university city. This is the University of Salamanca. It was after Oxford and Cambridge in the Middle Ages. This was the third greatest university city of Europe. But when the Spanish Inquisition came along, they sort of clamped down on liberal thought, and it lost its position in, in the world of uh, academia. But recently, or in recent, much more recent times, of course, it re-emerged as a great university. And the buildings, for example, exquisite sort of architectural decoration on these university buildings. This one is La, La Casa de las Conchas, the uh, scallop shell building built by a member of the Order of the Knights of Santiago de Compostela who was celebrating in the Middle Ages, you know, this, I think, uh, the great route to Santiago de Compostela. And that now is, the li is a library in uh, Salamanca. Just next to it there, you see an edge of the cathedral of Salamanca. Then we press on, and uh, again, <laughs> pretty flat at this point, nice easy road to cycle on, nice easy road. And then we come to this uh, Milario. You remember I showed you in the book, that book of the walking guy with that Milario. Well, we found the actual Milario uh, and it says Via de la Plata and underneath it's in Arabic because of course the Muslims ruled uh, for hundreds of years prior to the Reconquista. And uh, of course, Joseph is a great climber. He loved climbing anything. And of course he had to climb this, uh, this Milario this Roman Milaria with its symbol on the right there of the uh, grim uh, in the water bottle. And then we're on on route now and we come across these troglodyte dwelling, these houses where which are built into the hillside. And I'd love to have gone into them because apparently they're built because it's cool in summer and uh, dry and uh, warm in the winter we didn't actually win the game and the going now gets a bit tough every so often you have to push them or I did and then we reach this uh, albergue this pilgrim's hostel it looks an absolute bore doesn't it um, very unprepossessing building we've got a great granary here on the left square building behind uh, and that's looks a pretty green building. But at the entrance there was this man. And he was a volunteer in this pilgrim hostel. You can see Albergi Peregrino is there. And he was the volunteer. And he said to us, he spoke a bit of English, and he'd been food shopping that afternoon. And in the evening, by did he cooked for us all who were in this little hostel. He cooked for us a lovely paella, and here we are around the table. And they were all pilgrims, all walking uh, from Seville, probably up to Santiago. And they were all men, except for this lady on the left with her partner next to her. And Jose, a uh, volunteer here, he cooked for a paella, he provided wine, he provided liqueurs afterwards, and dessert. Not any did it cost, except there was a donativo you could make a donation. So Joseph and I, the next morning, you know, we put in donativos each one. But what a sort of hospitality and a gracious man. And those people around the table, we were in this tiny dormitory. I hardly slept. The person next to me was snoring very heavily. I think it was the woman there. But um, anyway, it was a lovely place to stay overnight. And one of the things he gave us, or he gave me, was this little cross here of the Santiago Pilgrim. And, you know, I put it on my 
I still have it today. And next morning we passed two of the men who were around that table the night before, and they were two Spanish men. They were probably late 60s, possibly early 70s. Uh, and they were walking from Malaga on the coast to Santiago de Compostela. And they told me that they aimed to take 52 days the night before, and they were taking 52 days to hike to, uh, to walk Santiago de Compostela. Then you proceed, you come upon uh, interesting hillside towns like this, through ancient villages. Uh, we're now in Galicia, ancient, ancient, it, the likes of which you probably wouldn't see in England, certainly would you, this age. Um, and then you're getting into very hilly country, uh, with not exactly mountains, but very high hills. Uh, like this, for example. And I'm showing you this picture because it was so cold <laughs> for a couple of days, I had to wear my long johns, as you can see, and I had a pair of sealskin socks that I had to have over my hands uh, to keep warm because that morning and a couple of mornings, there was ice on the road and on the track, and it was really very cold. Uh, and we eventually, on top of one of the hills, we came to this bar. And inside was this scene, scholarships. And this lady was a pilgrim on her way to Santiago with her partner. Uh, and what they do, they sign their scholar shell, souvenir, come up on the ceiling on the wall. A very unique place, this in a tiny village on a hillside. And then we get to an, another Roman bridge, but the actual uh, bridge itself is medieval, but the foundations were Roman. And we're in the Galician uh, town of Urense. And this is the main square, the Plaza Mayor of Urense. Just around the corner, right in the center of town, this scene, so oh, it's this side, I took this the next morning, and it's a thermal pool, because Urende is famous for its thermal bath, and it's all, it's all free and, you know, lovely hot water coming up from two kilometres or something below the ground. And when you go by the river in Urende, you come to these thermal pools, uh, established by the Romans way back a thousand years ago. Of course, Joseph and I had to have a, an indulgence you know, in these thermal pools. Terrific it was, lovely and hot with a nice aroma, hot for it, but uh, gorgeous, you know, to spend an hour or so in there. And then we're approaching now Santiago de Compostela. And we come at this point through the one forest that we went through on the whole month's journey. Uh, you know, there weren't, there were hardly any trees for a start, let alone a forest, but to get to, close to uh, Compostela, Santiago, uh, this was a forest. It's pretty hilly there. And then eventually we reach our destination, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, I'd been there before, about six years before, I'd cycled actually from England across northern Spain to Santiago de Compostela. And Joseph had actually walked there a couple of years before from um, Santander over the mountains in the winter, in the deep snow, on his own. Uh, and so we'd both been to Santiago de Compostela, but we'd come on this route, the Via de la Plata, which incidentally, only 3% of all pilgrims use that route. It's the least used route of the uh, Camino de Santiago's. And there's the great cathedral of uh, Compostela, Santiago. And there's the uh, facade of it looking all very clean and neat. But six years before, I told you I cycled there, um, this was the scene. I took this picture six years before, and you can see it's all covered in sort of verdigris. Uh, and this is because Galicia is the wettest part of Spain. Uh, of course, you were there either time, which was lucky, we were uh, But inside, on our trip this time, 
uh, it was all being renovated. So you couldn't see the great Otofumero celebration where they swing the great uh, urn uh, across the uh, cathedral inside a great ceremony, which I saw the previous time. And, but what you have to do when you get to the cathedral of Santiago, you have to visit the relics, supposed relics of Santiago St. James, the disciple of Christ, who uh, in time apparently, although never proved, and his relics, uh, I don't think they've ever been DNA'd, but his relics are in this silver castle below the altar. And so all pilgrims pay their respects there. And here's an image of Santiago, St. James, in gold and silver, probably came from the mines of uh, Peru and Mexico way back in the 17th century. And that's above the altar. And so you go up, you climb steps, and you stand behind the uh, statue of St. James. One of the rituals of the uh, Camino is you then hug the statue, which I did. And you do it in a way as a sort of uh, a measure of thanks for the pilgrimage. Now, we weren't doing it for religious reasons, as medieval pilgrims did. But it was, it did have a kind of spiritual dimension to it because, you know, the people we met, we met, the landscapes we've seen, the camaraderie between myself and Joseph. I mean, he lives in Toronto, so we don't see much of each other. So it's great to be together for a... And then what you do when you're a pilgrim, you queue up with other pilgrims to get your certificate to go that you um, followed this route. Nino de Santiago. And what you have to do, you show your pilgrim record, your credential uh, of your route. And in it, of course, are all the stamps that you've got along the way of all the albergues you stay in and the churches you visit and so on. And when you do that, you then get your certificate, your uh, Compostela, all in Latin. Second one I've got, and it's all in Latin to Colum Gillingham. And if you go and come to my study where I'm sitting in now, actually, um, you'll see up on the wall the certificate framed with the uh, shell, the scallop shell at the bottom there, and that lovely little cross with, with Jose, that nice volunteer gave me uh, as a symbol of journey and one really important to me. Now, uh, Santiago, we're coming to, an, uh, to the end now, and Santiago de Compostela is a great, is a, always been, or for centuries, has been a great spiritual mecca. But it's also a very touristy place now. Uh, but don't let that put you off. I'm sure some of you have been there anyway. But um, in the souvenir shops, you see pictures like this, or like this. And these things are what's called oreos. And they're uh, granaries that uh, are the symbol, in a way, of Galicia. It's the great symbol of Galicia, and you see them everywhere. There are 30,000 of these oreos, or grain stalls, in Galicia. And they're built on sort of pillars here with plates there to keep out rodents from the wheat and the grain and the maize that have been in there, you know, for years and years. And they were sort of, they weren't there in Roman times, but they from the Middle Ages or so. And they're not used now, really, but um, you see them everywhere. And I'll finish now with just showing you a few of these many oreos that we pass in these little villages uh, on, the, on the Camino. Some ancient like this one. Now there's a final postscript to my journey here, or our journey. Uh, 
And I'm going to take you now to the station, the railway station in Santiago de Compostela. Here it is. Now, we had to get the fast train from Santiago back to Madrid. Because I was flying back the next day. I had my ticket and the ticket for the bike to fly back to London from Madrid the next day. And Joseph had to be back to his partner and his family in Madrid. So we had to get the fast train that day. So we go into the ticket office and say, you know, can we open for Madrid? And the lady said, your bicycle's been taken apart and wrapped in plastic. She said, well, you can't, you can't take them. We had no time to take them apart and wrap them in plastic. We didn't have all the kit or anything. But then she said, why don't you have a word with the news agent next to my ticket office. So we go across to the news agent, and here he is, lovely chap, 15 euros each. He had a bike. Using cable ties, did a great job, wrapped them up in plastic, <laughs> cardboard, and cling film all the way around, uh, and we were sorted. And the train came in, the fast train to Madrid, and there it is. Joseph, always helping me, lifts the heavy blooming bike and all the kit into the train. And we were in Madrid in a couple, two or three hours, I forget. And that was it. And that was the end of our journey. So there we are, folks. Thank you very much for watching it. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed reliving uh, this journey for you. And uh, I hope you all, I hope we all have a, a happy Christmas and let's look forward to a much better year and the year in which we can travel perhaps uh, in 2001. So many thanks to you for your kind attention.